Hi guys, welcome back to yet another fun DIY sailboat refit video here aboard good old Athena. My name is Mess. I purchased Athena four years ago and I am now at the tail end of a somewhat extensive refit. If building a new rudder using vacuum infusion, gutting the interior of an old sailboat to make some structural repairs, or painting the top side sounds like fun to you, then feel free to check out some of my other videos here on YouTube. I've got this week off of my day job, which is good because that means I can spend more time here aboard Athena, which is very needed because in about six months, my fiance Ava and I are gonna move aboard and start cruising full time. This week, I would like to put up the separation between what will be the shower and the saloon, prime and paint the nav station area, mount this chart plotter, this VHF radio, this NMEA 2000 multi-function display, and also set up an NMEA 2000 network. Mount most of, if not all, of the winches out here in the cockpit so that I can order the spray hood that's going to attach to the fiberglass dodger. I'd also like to make a one-to-one -one scale wooden model of the solar arch that's going to go here on the back of the boat to figure out the solar panel layout. It's going to be a busy week. I'm not sure all of that is going to make it into the video because it's going to end up being three hours long. Long, but why don't we start with the separation between the shower and the saloon. The plywood should be a pretty good fit already, but uh, let's test it. I was planning on not putting up this separation here until I'd gotten the generator in place in the technical compartment, but the whole generator situation is up in the air and I won't really know what's gonna happen until about three months from now. So I figured I might as well finish this area. It is a little bit cramped in here for shooting video, but fortunately I've got a wide angle lens on my phone. So that should be able to show you guys what's going on in here. See, I've got plenty of room here for a glass butt joint. That's perfect. But here on the outside, there's not a lot of room down here, but that's okay. The engine axis here could do with a little bit of a rethink. And when I'm doing that, I can make absolutely sure that the bottom part of this separation here is thoroughly glassed to the rest of the boat. I've done a lot of glass butt joints and it's in no way needed, but just for the fun of it, I thought I'd try throwing a couple of biscuits in the mix this time. Like I mentioned, this is in no way needed for strength. It's just to try something new and have a little bit of fun with it. If you're gonna be working with epoxy in cold temperatures, I highly recommend you build a little epoxy heating box like the one I've got here. This one has a silicon heating mat in it, but you could use something as simple as an incandescent bulb. Something as simple as that and one of these dirt cheap thermostats from eBay would do a great job. It makes it super easy to mix the epoxy. And also if you get those white little flakes in epoxy that sometimes occur when it's stored cold. It is super easy to just heat it back up and get those dissolved back into the epoxy. I should really be wearing gloves right now, but because of COVID, everything except grocery stores are closed, and I doubt wrapping my fingers in salami would help very much. Blop. As a rule of thumb, I think just the butt joint there is gonna be roughly 20% of the strength of the plywood. By adding the glass that I'm gonna lay up tomorrow, the joint should be way stronger than the plywood. It's a couple of days later, and as you might be able to see, a little bit of progress has been made. I've mounted all of the winches in the cockpit. It's easy to see that these are not new winches. They are over 30 years old, and that is starting to show. But a few months back, I serviced all of them and they are in perfect working order. Winches are crazy expensive, so replacing them just because they look a little bit worn is not really an option. A friend of mine here in the marina had his re-chromed, so they look brand new, and that might be an option. It's just not very high on my to-do list right now. The reason I wanted to get the winches mounted now is so that I can get the fabric extension that's gonna go on the fiberglass dodger ordered. That is gonna extend back to 
somewhere right around here. So there needs to be an opening so that I can use the winches. If any of you guys know of a good, reliable fabric wrangler I should get a quote from here in Denmark, please go ahead and drop a comment down below. Inside of the boat, I have primed and gotten the first coat of paint applied in the nav station area. And I think it looks pretty dang spiffy. There's a slight bit of texture to this paint that I'm gonna have to sand before I can apply another coat of paint. But yeah, so far, so good. For good measure, let's insert the obligatory personal preference disclaimer here. I like painted wood. I don't like a ton of varnished wood inside of a boat. I think it gets too dark and too claustrophobic. So yeah, this is my personal preference. Your mileage may vary. To install the winches out in the cockpit, I had to clear out the old aft cabin. And that was good because I needed to double check some measurements for the lithium batteries that are gonna go here. But uh, yeah, we'll get back to that. I should be ready to order the batteries within the next couple of weeks. It's not supposed to rain today, so I wanna build that mock-up or model of the solar arch. There are a couple of reasons why I wanna build this mock-up. For one, I wanna figure out the angle between the solar arch and the deck, meaning how much it's tilting. I also wanna figure out the size and the layout of the solar panels. I wanna cram in as much solar up here as I possibly can. It's gonna be the best place for them. They're gonna be out of the way. There's not gonna be a lot of shading up here, but at the same time, I don't want them to protrude out several meters past the end of the boat. That'll just look weird. So yeah, a wooden mock-up seems like a good idea. Enter stage left, the cheapest of cheap wood. This wood is so cheap, it's likely to start melting if we see any kind of sunshine. I've attached a thin line to the wooden contraption here, meaning now I can slide it out to see how much tilt I want. This is around 105 degrees relative to the deck. This is at 111 degrees. I think this looks better. It's hard to tell with this pesky piling here in the middle, but I think this could be a winner. I've added the second part of the arch and from here, it looks pretty good. But seen from astern, I think it's very clear that this should be shorter so that it more matches the curvature of the hull. I know it doesn't look super awesome, but remember, this is just a mock-up to help me figure out the angle between the deck and the arch and to see how I can fit the solar panels. Here I've got a rough replica of a 360 watt solar panel. It's pretty freaking huge. The solar panel is two meters long and one meter wide. The piece of cardboard I've got here is only 70 centimeters wide, but it is two meters long. The top of the arch at the back here is about two meters. So we could fit two of these next to each other for a combined total of 720 watts of solar. And you know what? I don't think that's gonna look ridiculous. I mean, they're huge solar panels, but yeah, we're gonna have to squeeze them in somewhere and up there out of the way is probably our best bet. Seeing the arch like this, although it is a rough prototype, makes it clear to me that it doesn't make sense to build the arch without also adding some kind of hoisting mechanism for the dinghy. I think this has given me what I need to proceed with a more detailed drawing, but uh, yeah, we'll get back to the solar arch in the not too distant future. I swung by the stainless guy a few days ago and picked up a big box of goodies. There are four new pickup tubes for the diesel tank. These are gonna be for the fuel polishing system and for the fuel transfer system. There's also the business end of the bow roller. I still need to polish this, but other than that, it should be good to mount. And last but certainly not least, there are all of the brackets for the mini bulwark. These are all bent to individual measurements. You might be able to see the numbers on there. That's so that they match the angle of the deck where they're gonna be mounted. 
What I need to do now is to put each one of these in their corresponding spot up on deck just to double check that I got this measurement right. Once I'm sure that all of these are correct, I can give them back to the stainless guy and he's gonna weld on little bolts here on the bottom that I can then use to through bolt them through the deck hole joint. Up on deck, there's gonna be about a meter between each of these and then all the way along the deck hole joint, I'm gonna have a piece of wood that's 80 millimeters high so something like this bolted to them. This is my alternative to an aluminum tow rail that's gonna be crazy expensive. Plus I think this will look pretty cool. Now at every other one of these little brackets, there's gonna be room for a stanchion. And that look a little bit something like this. I think it's gonna look super spiffy. I also picked up these spiffy laser cut backing plates for these. I think this is gonna be a very strong and sturdy solution. I've sorted them into groups by their angles. On my phone, I've got a spreadsheet with the angle of each of the positions up on deck. So I know the first one is gonna be one of these guys. I've sorted the brackets. This is the starboard side and this is the port side. The interesting thing is that there was a, there was an extra one. I need 11 for each side, which is what is here. So yeah. Well, maybe this guy will come in handy later on. Just for the fun of it, here you can see the two outermost extremes. Now, this might not look like a big difference here, but remember, some of these are gonna have a stanchion on them. Those are 60 centimeters tall. That amount of difference, that kind of adds up when you go 60 centimeters up. I'm not so much interested in starboard versus port because of course the boat is not sitting perfectly level in the water. What I'm more interested in is the deviation between each of the points on one side. And after copious amounts of oh glorious double checking, I've got the result right here and they look pretty spiffy. The deviation between each of the points on one side is within one degree on both sides of the boat. But what's really cool is the fact that every one of the positions where there's gonna be a stanchion is within 0.3 of a degree. As an example, these two lines here are 60 centimeters long. That's how tall the stanchions are. And the deviation between the two here is one degree. So 0.3 is, well, it's very, very little. Now I can give these back to the stainless guy so he can weld on the little bolts on the bottom here and also some way of securing the stanchions and then I can get them back, polish them and mount them. It's a couple of days later, happy 2021 guys. Now I had some issues painting the nav station. I rushed and I got some sags. So I had to do a bit of sanding before I could finally finish painting the nav station but at least I'm now satisfied with the result. Annoyingly, the last of the locks I need for securing this panel here in the middle of the nav station didn't show up in time. There's always a silver lining, and in this case, it's that you guys get to provide some input on the layout of this panel here. These are all the distribution panels I need to fit. There's 24 volts, 12 volts, and AC. And well, most of anything here is an option. I would like to be able to also fit a nine inch chart plotter on this panel. You might think, but wait, it would be perfect to put the chart plotter somewhere on this surface, but this surface here is reserved for a 24 inch computer monitor. For editing videos or for doing software development, which is my day job, having a big 4K monitor here would be awesome. And also having the chart plot of instance up here would be really cool because then you can see it from all of the saloon. This is my chart plotter of choice. This is the Garmin 922XS Plus. We'll get back to this guy in detail in a few weeks. I just wanted to give you guys an idea of the size. The chart plotter won't really fit anywhere else with the 24 inch monitor in place unless we do something crazy and uh, put him up here. Anywho, I can't install any of this today because of that stupid missing lock. So uh, let's move on to something I can install today. The Garmin 215i VHF radio. This has DHC and it's compatible with this little guy, the GHS 11i, which is an external handset and also this little active speaker. The nav station is a great spot for the VHF radio. The only downside is that you'd have to come down below to use it, which is why adding the GHS 11i up in the cockpit is really cool because I believe this little guy lets us use all of the features of the VHF radio 
but up from the cockpit. I'm not going to install any electronics up in the cockpit until I've figured out the running rigging, so this little guy will have to wait a little bit, but we can still install the VHF radio. Having dug through the box, this is everything that was in there. There's the radio itself, there's a cover, wiring, faceplate, gasket, handset, mount, and some instructions, and thank you, Garmin, a flush mount template. This little guy is certainly gonna make my life easier. As always, no matter how easy the install seems, I'm gonna start by reading the manual. Because I'm mounting the VHF here inside of the boat, I can skip a lot of the mounting considerations. The, let's just have a quick look at the back of this. There are connections here for the old NMEA standard. We won't be needing any of that because there's also NMEA 2000. And then there is this little guy, which is a connection for an external GPS. The VHS does have an internal GPS. If that can't get a connection, you can use this. Or if you hook this up to NMEA 2000, which I certainly intend to do, it will get the GPS position from, for instance, the chart plotter. Then of course there's a connection for the coax cable and for the external handset. The only connection here on the front is for the included handset, which is an excellent segue into where I am going to mount this. I don't want the dangly bit here getting in the way of anything that's gonna be mounted on the panel here. So I think the VHF radio is gonna go up here in the corner and then we can figure out where to put the handset once we've got this guy in place. Every single product in the world should come with a mounting template. It's so nice to have. That is quite the milestone, the first marine electronic device mounted aboard Athena. Now I can't hook up the VHF radio today because I don't have the coax cable, but I think I might be able to hook up the NMEA 2000 multi-function display that's gonna go right next to the VHF radio. That's the GMI 20. These things are so freaking cool. They can display all kinds of information from your NMEA 2000 network and they're pretty tiny, so you can basically mount them anywhere. This little guy also comes with a mounting template, so installing him is gonna be a breeze. A quick little test fit. That is probably the easiest installation ever. A hole saw and four holes and then you're done. I wasn't even aware of this, but it looks like the GMI 20 also supports the older NMEA standard, but the ALDEP use NMEA 2000. As you can see, there's only the two NMEA plugs here on the back. So for NMEA 2000, all you need is just this one cable. There's no separate power cable. That's pretty cool. My plan is to add a second GMI 20 display next to this one, but these are highly customizable. So I think I'll hold off a little bit and see how much information I can cram in on this little guy. Let's bust out this NMEA 2000 starter kit and see if we can't get that display hooked up. This is the contents of the starter kit. Ignore this little guy, he came with the GMI 20 display, but he's identical to these ones. There is a power cable, there are two backbone or drop cables, there are two of these T connectors and two of these ND plucky terminator resistor thingies. Fun little side note, I've got one of the old T connectors here from Garmin and uh, as you can see, they are a different color. Apparently they will still connect, but if you mix the two, they're gonna be at a little bit of an odd angle. Like that, as you can see, it is <laughs> at a bit of an angle. So to have an easier time mounting these, you should probably just stick to one color. There's a perfect little drawing here that illustrates an NMEA 2000 network with a battery, chart plotter, and some other NMEA 2000 device. Note that T connections here can be connected either directly to each other or have a cable in between them. There's gonna be a backbone that runs throughout the length of the boat. That backbone is gonna be split up into sections divided by these little T intersection doohickeys here. And wherever there's one of these, I can attach a drop cable and hook up some kind of device. At both ends, you add one of these little pluggy thingies here, and that's basically an NMEA 2000 network. It's kind of like Legos for adults. One of the cool things about NMEA 2000 is that it's super easy to expand the network. 
you just slap on another T connector or a cable and then a T connector and then you can connect another doohickey to your network. Here is everything connected up. There's the backbone up here. There's a power connection to the Anime 2000 network. This cable goes to the ultrasonic tank level sensor out behind the engine. And this cable over here goes to the GMI 20. To give you guys something to look at, I've configured the GMI 20 to display the level of fuel in the diesel tank. As you saw, my NMA 2000 network is kind of on the small side. I've only got that one device, so I can't really show you a lot of customization of the GMI 20. But as you can see here, I've got one page and I can flip between pages with these two arrows here. So that's one page, that's the fuel level, and this is also the fuel levels, but they're in different layouts. So instead of four fuel levels here, I could have one that was fuel level, one that was temperature, and well, something else. So there's a lot of customizability in this little guy. Every road leads to Rome, only in this case, it's not roads, it's conduit, and it's not Rome, it's this little technical area. I've got a bunch of conduit throughout the boat, and it all comes out right inside of this little locker. I've hooked up my trusty vacuum to one end of one of those conduits. Here I've got some thin line with a piece of paper towel on it. So now let's turn on the vacuum and feed the beast. It sounds very hungry. And what emerges from the deep but that piece of paper towel and the two lines. Now I can connect my NMA2000 cable to the line, pull it through and connect it to the tank level sensor. I finished running the cable into this little area and all I really need now to be able to shove all of the NMA stuff in there is just a little bit of DC. I need to figure out how I want to do cable management in here to keep things neat and tidy. There are already bus bars on the distribution panel, so I don't have to worry about that. But maybe it'll be nice with some terminal bars in here to keep things neat and tidy. If you've got a suggestion, go ahead and leave it as a comment down below. Like a giant dumbkopf, I just now realized that I've got plenty of other stuff that's basically ready to get connected to the Anime 2000 network. I've got the wind instrument, I've got the log, I've got this little engine gateway, I think I've got a thermometer somewhere too. So yeah, plenty of other cool stuff. I think next week's video is gonna be a look at 2020, the plan for the first six months of 2021, because like I mentioned, we only have about six months until we need to untie the lines and leave Denmark. And then maybe I'll get to play with all of these NMA 2000 devices. That would be pretty cool. I'll end this video by wishing all of you a super duper happy new year and uh, well, that's gonna be the end of this video. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below. And don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like. See you.